The rule of King Lorsan was more syncretic than that of his father. Lorsan did not burn any temples nor ban any festivities. He even began to see the old pagan rituals of the land of Vanon in a Christian way, like reinterpreting Beltane as a celebration of the creation of Adam and Eve, or allowing medicine women and herbalists to continue their magic as an honoring of the miracles of God. Brothers Arlo and Venenzo, in their tutelage of Lorsan as a king, would tell him he misunderstood the holy scriptures and not to interpret them himself, but these lessons didn't necessarily sink in. To appease his teachers, of whom he was regardless very fond, he allowed them to return to their pope in Rome if they wished. In their late sixties, their ministry seemed to be coming to an end, so deliberated on the matter. Venenzo accepted the offer, and would be brought back to Rome by a protected retinue of the king's men, and would report back to the church on the work that had been done on the Isle of Man. Arlo, however, decided to stay, and continue on his histories of Vanon, known to many simply as the Chronicle, training up a group of apprentices in the faith as he did so. King Lorsan's theological leniency in this regard, and mercy to his subjects in general, earned him the moniker of the good King Lorsan. Indeed, he was a wise and fair king for his years. However, this was decidedly not the face he would show to his enemies. He realized early in his upbringing the same thing that his father did, that all conquest must be justified. An unjust conqueror does not maintain greatness, and his bloodline withers, but the Monad clan had been given the ultimate justification a holy justification. The conquests of Vanon would not be ones of vanity or greed. They would follow in the footfalls of the Lord. The Creator himself had handed them a blessing to go forth and bring all the land on earth into Christendom. King Lorsan was a tactician at heart, and used the speed of his light footmen, the isolation of his island, and the dread violence of his soldiers, all to his advantage. In foreign lands, he was not called the Good King Lorsan. Indeed, most knew him by a different title. The Black Dragon. King Lorsan took to this so well that he made it his standard. Consulting Brother Arlo, who understood the rules of heraldry, they crafted the symbol of Vanon which would represent it for centuries. A Black Dragon, more specifically an amphiptyr, coiled in the center, glaring menacingly from a stark red field. The rule of the good King Lorsan, the Black Dragon, would see his father's work finished, going to war with the duchies of Buchan, Obar de Thane, and Sin Cardain. Meanwhile, by the year 927, larger kingdoms began to coalesce from the shattered Europe, such as Danmark, Savoy, and the Pilsen League. Danmark was a Viking kingdom ruled over by King Seldane Friderson a man related to the pagan exiles of Vanon by marriage. Despite this, Dan Mork would not raid Vanon in particular, and so that fell to the men who lived further north. Savoy was a principality characterized by its focus on the accumulation of material wealth, and despite its present state of impoverishment, its prince, Ligno Salvona, was regardless striving to enrich the realm. Finally, and perhaps most oddly, the Pulsen League was a conglomeration of local towns and general leaders who recognized the many dangers of remaining atomized and alone, but were not at all prepared to relinquish their power to any one of themselves. Instead, they formed a local alliance that would essentially be ruled by a high king, the appointing of which all the local lords would have a say in. This alliance was generally centered around the city of Pulsen, where the High King sat, and where this odd conglomerate kingdom got its name. There was much talk about what this meant for Europe, that groups of people were declaring kings at an incredibly rapid pace, carving for themselves pockets of order out of the chaos. Some said that it was a sign from God, that he had forgiven mankind, and was allowing it to rebuild. However, there were even more who said that this was now a race. And whosoever failed to acquire as much of Europe as possible would be paying for that failure for the rest of history.
King Lorsan met his first true challenge in war during the conquest of Frova, where the defending duchy called its two allies from the south of Britain, the Viking duchy Dunating and the petty kingdom of Chester. They were able to field a force twice the size of King Lorsan's at 9,500 men, and began to occupy territory in the south. Lorsan was able to muster support from the Northern Isles, however, and raised an additional 8,000 men. Attacking when the rival armies were divided, they were decimated and Frova then fell in short order. In the years after the conquest of Frova, a crowning achievement after the conquest of the three prior realms, King Lorsan bided his time, recovering the damage done to his lands and levies. Meanwhile, the vengeful pagan lords had long since established themselves in the north, and through their influence Viking raids became more frequent, sailing the waves to assault the place that was once their home. It was not yet very difficult to handle, but then again, it was only just beginning. In 929, due to a relatively weak ecclesiastical structure in the Kingdom of Vannon, it became a breeding ground for heresies, and a sizable Lollard revolt needed to be put down, which further impeded the good king's efforts to recover from war. To make matters worse, Brother Arlo died on the 11th of November 930 at the age of 74. He was buried on the grounds of the Church of St. Guthlach, and the funeral held for him was grand. Hymns were sung the whole day over, as a traditional pagan dirge was played the whole night. Lorsan wept bitterly. Indeed, the Black Dragon mourned for him as he didn't even for his own father. Brother Arlo left behind his opus, The Histories of Vanon, which fell into the care of the unofficial monastic order that followed after him, called the Holy Order of Brother Arlo the Evangelist. They were tasked with preserving, copying, perfecting, protecting, and continuing to write the histories, so long as Vanon existed as a place or as a people. They also took on the usual monastic tasks of biblical scholarship, aiding the poor, and training up priests in order to prepare them for a life in service to the church. King Lorsan ensured that another man was sent to Rome in order to petition for the recognition of this priestly order, an homage and final gift to his beloved teacher. To distract himself from this ocean of grief, he rallied the troops and began to prepare for an invasion of Istrad Klut a powerful rival of Vannon which impeded further expansion south. However, while he prepared for the invasion, King Lorsan Monad died of severe stress on the 12th of August 932 at the age of 61. His eldest son, Grimmer Monad, became king at the age of 40. <laughs> 